Hello everyone, welcome to Rational Science. Uh, I thought for a moment I was cut off. <laughs> welcome to Rational Science, uh, directly from Frankfurt, Germany, and uh, the only site on the internet that does science. Everybody else does particles. And you cannot explain a single phenomenon of nature, invisible and intangible phenomenon of nature, with particles in a rational manner. And um, science is about rationality, rational explanations. So yeah, this is the only site that does science. And today we're gonna to talk about uh, an uninvited guest, and his name is God. But he's not the God of the Bible. He's uh, the God of quantum mechanics. He's the God of uh, really of mathematical physics, specifically. Of, math, of quantum mechanics. And the other day we covered God, the God of Christianity primarily, and we found out that, you know, he, he, he's there, right? I mean, uh, religion claims that God is eternal, that he had no maker. And I really have no problem with that, you know, uh, I can accept that hypothesis. The problem I have with, with uh, God, with eternal God, is not him. It's how he created something from nothing. How he created matter from total void, total nothingness, from space, from vacuum. That, that's, uh, I can't find the spec or the instructions or the process in the Bible. That's the problem I have with, with the notion of an eternal God. Uh, you know, how he created the first bit of matter. And quantum mechanics, together with general relativity and the rest of mathematical physics, has a similar problem because they get rid of God altogether. But they do believe and propose and spread that matter came into existence, uh, I guess you can call it from nothing, whatever nothing is, because when you put them, you, you, you put the uh, mathematicians against the uh, ropes and begin to pummel them and you say, well, where did the bit, first bit of matter come into existence? Uh, they say it's an unscientific question. And they put it off like that. They say it's like asking what's north of the North Pole or who knows what. And the reason they say that is that, um, or the, the way they justify it, is by saying they have no way of testing that hypothesis. Okay, so in either case, we have to concede or grant as a starting point, not from frame one, but for frame two. Frame one, in one case, we already have God. In the other one, we have something, and call it whatever you want, and from that point on, we have the Big Bang explosion and everything that we have see today. So what we're going to look at today is, is that process, how this god of quantum mechanics uh, grew into adulthood. I, I think he's a teenager today because, I mean, I would think that God has, uh, the god of mathematics, right, has a long life ahead of him. Uh, I would say maybe trillions of years. Assuming that's the case, well, he's in, he's in his infancy now, okay? And today we're going to look at the process, not of how he began, because, you know, they concede that. They say he already started or he was there or whatever. And we're going to look at how he grew up, okay? And so let's look at these two gods, the one from Christianity, compare them against the one from mathematical physics, and see if there, if there are any differences and what those differences are, if any. Okay, here it is. Okay, uh, the God of the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, so he was already around, okay? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay, and in the case of quantum, uh, the quantum Bible, the ancient quantum Bible that is, is at least or close to 100 years old, uh, it says, In the beginning there was nothing. Okay, and we're going to try to find out what this nothing is. Part of it has to do with that. And, but they say that there was no God in a Christian sense or in the Old Testament sense uh, that there was a God around to do any of this. So they get rid of God altogether. In fact, all these people claim that they are atheists, that they don't believe in the existence of God. And so they try to do what they say, what they call scientifically. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do this scientifically, okay? Okay, let's uh, go to step number two. Uh, we get the first frames or frame of the movie of the universal movie and here's the two versions uh in the case of christianity you, said that you read that and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters 
Okay, so there were waters. We don't know where those came from. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. In other words, he created the day from the night, because uh, in the day you have this sunny day. In other words, you have a sun, you have clouds, you have a blue sky. And at night it's like dark and uh, little stars are out there, so it's a little different. Okay, so that's, I guess, what they're referring to. In the case of uh, mathematical physics, we have the quantum foam, that's where it starts, says, and the quantum foam moved upon the face of the false vacuum. Okay. And the equation said, let E equals MC squared, then there was energy. And the mathematician saw the energy, that it was scientific. Okay? And then they equated energy with space. That's essentially their version of creation, in a nutshell. Okay? According to mathematical physics, space is a physical object made of particles. In other words, uh, it's the ether. The same thing we've had for the last 3,000 years. Ether, a bunch of particles. Uh, and the only issue there is whether all these bunch of particles are space, the word space refers to all these bunch of particles, or whether uh, the particles are contained within a container called space. And those are two different uh, notions of the ether. One is a bunch of particles, and you wonder what separates one particle from the other. You know how you can distinguish them unless there's something in between them, okay? And that form, that whole body forms space vacuum, whatever you want to call it. The ether is space in that case. And in the other case, it's uh, these particles that are within something called space, which is, I guess, some kind of container that has a border, uh, a fence. And the only issue there also is, you know, uh, what's outside of the fence? What gives shape to that container called space? So all these things are the ones that these people have yet to justify and somehow uh, rationalize for us, okay? So this is where we, we're at. Okay, so what happens next? Well, let's look at uh, one version here. This is the Christian version. It says, God is assumed to be eternal. That's fine, we'll concede that. God creates heaven and the earth. There we have a problem because now he's creating something from nothing and we don't know how he did that. Okay, but here's the issue. The issue, because this is where the difference is gonna be with mathematical physics. Okay, so pay attention to this. It's the timing, okay? The Bible, if you go by the Bible, literal reading of the Bible, no reason to interpret anything here. I'm sure God would not like us to be confused. There's a supreme being. I think if, if he wrote the Bible, if he's the author, as is said out there, um, he would have written the Bible in such a way that everybody understands the same thing. And the way I look at it, if uh, we're all confused and we don't, cannot explain, and this guy interprets one thing, the other guy interprets something else, we have to think that it's the devil who's sticking his tail in there, right, confusing people. That's my logic for that, okay? Anyways, here it is. Uh, what does God do on the first day? Uh, he creates light, okay? And separates night from day. Second day, he creates the firmament, the heaven, the sky. And what does he do that for? Apparently to separate the waters. Okay, the waters from the ocean from the, from the sky, I guess, okay? Third day, we have dry land for the first time. You know, we can put our feet on something, okay? We have um, dry land, seas, and he creates the plants. Okay. Uh, fourth day, we have the sun, the moon, and the stars. He finally sprinkled all these little dots out there in the sky, who knows for what reason, I guess for our enjoyment, so we would not see a dark uh, sky all day long, and you know, we would look up there and see all these little lights and say, oh, interesting, how nice. Okay. Um, fifth day, he creates the fishes and the birds. So we've got something inside the water, we have something in the air. Okay. And finally, he thinks about populating the earth. We have terrestrial animals and man. Okay. We finally came in there. And I guess we were the last ones to be created, you know, and uh, you wonder why. And then uh, seventh day, uh, God rested. And my only issue there is why did God need to rest? I mean, he's all powerful. And all he's got to do is say abracadabra, voila, you know, hocus pocus, whatever the magic incantation is. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it would not even take a day. It would take one second, a split second, and whatever he creates, it's there. Now, if he took a full day, you would think there's some kind of process, some mechanism, some specification of how to do this, okay? It'd be nice, you know, it would have been nice if he would have written that down, you know, in the uh, Bible, so we knew what the process was for creating these things. But again, if he did it by hocus-pocus, magic, whatever, uh, I don't know why he needed to rest. I think the only reason he would need to rest is if he's tired, and if he's tired, it's because it took him some kind of effort, physical effort, to create these things throughout the whole day. And yeah, again, it'd be nice to know what the process was.
Okay, but we don't have that information. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us. And that was a big omission, I think. Okay, okay so how does uh, quantum mechanics do it? Um, let's put it over here so we can compare it side by side. Okay, and you have this chronology, which I'm going to go over in a minute, but I want you to look at something. I want you to look at the timing. The timing is totally different. And unlike uh, the uh, one on the left that goes day by day, in other words, it's, it's constant. It uses a single... Um, unit, which is the 24-hour day, I would think, because I don't see why they would have to call it a day if it's not a day. And, you know, uh, you would think that that's a full day, especially when he created, he said, you know, separates night from day. He says that in there, or the Bible says that, and, uh, God says, is telling us this. Uh, if he separated night from day, uh, meaning a 24-hour human day, you would think each one of these took one human day. There's no reason to think that, uh, that you have to interpret these days as millions of years or anything like that. On the other hand, on the right side, you see something very different. Uh, the first uh, few um, phases took seconds, actually microseconds, okay? Took a very, very small amount of time. From there, they jumped to minutes. From there, they jumped to thousands of years, to millions of years, and to billions of years. So uh, the chronology there is totally exponential, okay? The, the one that uh, quantum mechanics comes up with uh, to explain the origin of the universe, right? Okay, uh, so let me get back in here. Okay, uh, the other thing I want you to see is this. Um, uh, this is, these are the phases, the epochs for each one of the two eras. There's two eras. One is the radiation era that, and again, we're talking about right after the Big Bang because we don't know what happened at that first frame, at frame number one where the Big Bang uh, was getting ready to explode, okay? So we don't know what happened there, and they don't have an answer for that, and they say it's outside of the bounds of science, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, fine. So all we can do is look at from frame number two onwards, okay? And this is what you get. You get two stages, or epochs, or eras, periods, whatever you want to call them. One is the radiation era, and it consists of all these uh, epochs. Uh, Planck, the Grand Unified, okay? The, uh, which is the Grand Unified Theory, okay? Remember, they're trying to unite forces, okay? And that's what they're going to talk about there. Then they have the inflationary period where this thing expands uh, apparently exponentially again. Electroweak, the quark, the hadron or hadron, pronounced differently in different parts of the world, uh, which is when you get into the neutrons and protons, okay? And then suddenly you jumped into the leptons and the nuclear uh, era, on the other side, you get, um, see this, the ones on the left are going to be in seconds and maybe you could call it even a minute. When you get on the right-hand side, the matter area, now you get into uh, thousands, millions, and billions of years. And we get the atomic uh, uh, epoch, the galactic, and the stellar. Okay, so that's, in a nutshell, uh, what they propose, okay, what the mathematicians propose. And here's a... Um, I guess you could say a, a quick synopsis of this so that you can see what I'm going to cover here and, and how they view this, okay? Um, these are the different eras, okay, and the different epochs within each era. Okay, here's the matter era here, uh, divided into atomic, galactic, and stellar um, epochs. And the first part, which is the radiation era, uh, is separated by these, uh, Planck, the... Um, Grand unification or unified, right? The inflationary period, which is the world expands exponentially. And then you go to these, the quarks, the hadron, and lepton, and the nuclear. Okay? So that's essentially um, how mathematical physics sees the uh, evolution of the universe. And again, I would have to suspect that Father Universe is not so much Father, maybe he's a teenager by now, okay? So I don't know how mature he is. <laughs> okay? Okay, here's the first era, uh, known as the Planck era, which is uh, microseconds. Uh, I mean, you're talking about, what is it, 10 to the minus 43, I think, uh, seconds, right after a Big Bang. So it's, uh, you don't even have time to measure because it's already gone. Okay, so that's how fast this was. It was just, blip, it, was, it came and went. <laughs> okay, and here it is. Okay, and this is, um, this is again, the Planck era, uh, uh, the Planck epoch. Okay, and it says the Planck epoch, what does it consist of? It's no matter existed, you know, um, in the universe at this point in time, okay? And um, only energy, whatever energy is. Again, they, they use this word energy as a substitute. I call it the word spirit because uh, they claim there's no real matter, no particles, I guess you could say, because even if you have a single particle, you would think that's matter. 
but they say, no, all we have at this point in time are energy and the ancestor of the four forces. Okay, and now they're not talking about the four horses of the apocalypse. They're talking about four forces of quantum mechanics. And we have a problem here, a real problem, because uh, I can only imagine two forms of contact, and, uh, which we call forces. One is pull and one is push. That's it. And in fact, if you go into quantum, you find uh, the two push forces. One is the photon, the electromagnetic uh, force, and the other one is the weak force. Okay, and those are the push forces because they are outward going. Uh, they go out of the atom. And then you have the two pull forces. One is gravi gravity, uh, which they have never figured out, and the other one is the uh, gluon, which holds you know, the quarks together inside the nucleus of the atom. So we have two push forces, two pull forces, but they claim they have four forces. Uh, so you figure it out, okay? So uh, the issue is, right now we have no particles, matter. They have what? They have energy and they have forces. But it turns out when you go into quantum, they mediate all forces with particles. They say the forces are particles. Because what is the electromagnetic force? Well, that's the photon. It's a little ball, supposedly, that mediates light and electromagnetic phenomena such as magnetism. So, so you have a particle anyways. And what is uh, the weak force? It's a particle. The W's and Z's are particles. What is the graviton? Well, it's the mediator of gravity, which is a force, but what is the mediator? The graviton. What is the gluon? Allegedly another particle that mediates the strong force. So they're all particles, and a particle is matter, but they're claiming there's no matter in this period, this era, or this uh, epoch, the Planck uh, epoch. Um, all you have is forces, and what are forces? Particles. What are particles? Matter. <laughs> so. <laughs> They have a circular argument, in other words. And why? Because they never define their terms. They're suggesting that they're talking about particles, but when you say, well, are you talking about really particles, like, you know, little balls? No, no, we're talking about numbers. We're talking about quantities. We're talking about amounts and units and that kind of stuff. It's all math. It's got nothing at all to do with particles, meaning it's got nothing to do with physics. So all they're doing is describing uh, this uh, epoch mathematically and what happens uh, according to them inside the labs. At such and such temperatures, you create certain effects, and that's what they extrapolated to the beginning of the universe. Okay, so this is what, how they came up with all this stuff. Okay, at the end of this epoch, uh, gravity split away from the superforce. The superforce is the four forces together. Okay, and so you have gravity in there, you have gluon in there, you have the weak force, and you have the electromagnetic force. They're all in this so-called superforce. Okay, so we have super force in there. Gravity, the graviton, I guess, is going to fly away. This force is going to fly away. It, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, how do you say, well, I have push and pull together in a super force, and I'm going to pull or, or expel the pull force out of there. What sense does that possibly make, that you're going to uh, expel or, or emit, get rid of the... Uh, the pull, one of the, the one of the two forces in this case, right? The pull force, you're going to kick it out, and you're going to stay only with another force in there. This is what they claim happened in the Planck era. They said they had four forces. One of them, in this case, gravitational force, was kicked out of the club. No longer belongs to the club. And now you have the other three forces. Keep in mind what forces you got in there. You have the strong force, okay, which is the gluon particle, no matter. <laughs> you have the uh, because we're not in the matter age yet. Uh, you have the electromagnetic force, the photon, a particle, which is not matter, I guess. And you have the weak force, the W's and Z's, which are particles, which are also not matter. Okay, we have these three forces still in there. We kicked out the graviton, or the gravity force. Okay, uh, what's next? We have the gut. Here it is, the gut, the grand unified theory, okay? And what is that? Well, uh, grand unified uh, has... Um, or they're trying to get this, this equation that represents the grand unified theory, meaning you have the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force together. And what happens here, they're going to kick out the strong force. They're going to kick it out of the club. And by doing so, they kicked out the two pull forces. They kicked out gravity in the previous uh, episode. Now, <laughs> now they're going to kick out the remaining pull force, the gluon force, the strong force, okay? And so that's what uh, this epoch deals with, the kicking out of this uh, force. Anyway, you want to 
interpret kicking out a force, okay, if that makes any sense to you. And so out of the three forces, now we have two forces in there, which are the electromagnetic force and the weak force, the Ws and Zs and the photon, okay, which are not particles, or <laughs> which are particles, but which are uh, not matter. Somehow you got to try to explain that, okay, or to yourself, okay. Okay, what's the next step? Well, now we got to separate these two forces, okay, so we got to separate the electromagnetic from the weak force, okay? And again, I don't know how to illustrate a force. I put it as a little bit of uh, smoke there. I mean, I hope you don't hold it against me. I have no other way of knowing what a force looks like, okay? So if you know, please let me know, okay? Uh, because I'm totally ignorant. I confess I'm totally ignorant in these matters. So I had to put some smoke, some different smoke between weak force and uh, the electromagnetic force. Please forgive me, okay? And yeah, this is when the, the electromagnetic force separates from the weak force, okay, in this, this stage. Now remember, all these are microseconds. You're talking about infinitesimal part of a second. That's how fast this was. Boop, boop, boop. You know, that's how it went. Didn't even give you time to breathe, and they were already separated. Okay, keep that in mind. It's a very swift process. And where did they get that, uh, all these things? They got them from equations. They do these calculations. Uh, from what they observe in the lab. And they say, look, at such and such temperature and at such and such speeds, uh, this is what happens. And they interpret that as a separation of forces. They extrapolate this to the beginning of the universe and they say, this is what must have happened, you know, uh, what is it, 13.7 billion years ago. Okay? So that's how they come up with all this stuff. Uh, it's all equations. It's got nothing to do with you trying to visualize how a force separates from another force. It's got to do with equations. They say at this temperature, this is what would have happened. Okay, so all calculations, nothing more than that. Okay, what's the next step? Uh, we have the, this uh, step here. And it's, uh, what is it, the electroweak. And uh, I know this is the one I just had. Hold on. Let me go with the next one here. Where is it? The quark one. <laughs> okay, so... Now we're in the quark age. What is a quark? Well, you have three quarks, and they form part of one of the uh, members of the uh, nucleus of the atom. Okay, so you have uh, what what are called nucleons. Okay, you have things like neutrons, you have things like uh, protons, and each one of these is made of three quarks. In one case, two downs and one up; the other one, two ups and one down. Not important at all. Okay, they have these three quarks that make up the atom. And this is the age when these quarks are made, okay? So it says the universe is uh, too hot for and dense for subatomic particles to form. So all you have so far are just these quarks and they're running around. Running around where? I suppose in space because each quark is contoured by space. What, what is the backdrop to each one of those particles? That's what you gotta ask. And the problem here is that space is made out of particles according to quantum mechanics. So we have particles inside particles. Particles inside the ether, as I said originally, okay? The space of quantum mechanics and the space of general relativity as well are made of particles, okay? So, so you don't have absolutely nothing. What you have is a sandbox, as I call it. They don't see it as a sandbox. They like to see it as a beehive, all these little bees running around. Um, I don't know. Uh, you figure it out if it's a sandbox or a beehive. Bunch of bees moving around, uh, you would need for them to be live. Otherwise, you would think that they're talking about a sandbox. And if you have a sandbox, you don't have much motion there other than perhaps gravitational motion, whatever gravity is, okay? So keep in mind all this stuff. They, they would not be able to explain a lot of this stuff um, because if they have a sandbox, uh, you know, how does one particle push another one over and do something with it? Create pressure or whatever you want to call it. You, you cannot explain uh, motion. And if you have beehives, well, the particles have to be alive because a beehive, you know, a bunch of bees, I think they're alive. They're, you know, flapping their wings. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, what comes next? Uh, the Hadron era or Hadron era. Okay. And what happens here? Uh, this is also a little bit magical. So, you know, hold on to your seat here. Okay. Hadron. Uh, the universe is, cools down a little bit. Okay. This allows quarks to bind together and form protons and neutrons. Okay. So we're going to form protons and neutrons simply because the temperature dropped. Okay, and one of the problems here is that you're, you're going to form like a nucleus of the atom, okay, and they're going to show how this ends up uh, creating not hydrogen, which is the number one element. They're going to start with helium. They're going to form helium. 
but it's going to be a helium atom that does not have electrons. It just has the nucleus. Okay? So keep this in mind. They're going to form a helium, helium atom, okay, which consists of four nucleons, in other words, two protons and two neutrons. Helium atom is not one and one, it's two and two. You would have to have two electrons to counterbalance the two positive protons, but there are no electrons. All you have is just two protons and two neutrons. Okay, and they call that, I guess, a helium atom, an ionized helium atom. Okay, okay so this is, this is uh, you've got to keep all this stuff in mind because there are, there are a lot of things that are not explained by quantum mechanics and all this. They just say, well, this is what the equations show and this is what the kind of temperatures you would need to create this, uh, this result. That's how they handle this. Okay, okay here we have um, the next era. The lepton and nuclear, we'll put them together here. Lepton and nuclear uh, uh, epoch. Uh, protons and neutrons form, uh, uh, are uh, fused and uh, form a, um, uh, again, a, a nucleus. A nucleus, uh, they, they form, each one of these is a nucleon, and when they get together, they form the nucleus, okay? And that's when the helium comes into being. Uh, I put the electrons in there so that they wouldn't look so bad. Uh, so ignorant, uh, because as far as I know, helium requires two electrons to, for it to be helium. Otherwise, all you have is two protons and two neutrons. Is that just that alone? Is that a helium atom? And you wonder also about, hold it, why doesn't hydrogen come first before helium? Because see, uh, the explanation they have for how a star works, let me get this guy out of here, uh, here. The explanation they have for how helium is formed, they say it's formed in the sun, in star, inside a star. And that's okay, I have no problem with that. In fact, I like that theory quite a bit. And they say you take four, you have to have four, four hydrogen atoms, you smash them together, okay? And with those four, you create a helium atom. Why? Because you have to have four nucleons, two protons and two neutrons, right? And because you have two protons, you only have two positive charges, you counterbalance that with two electrons, which are the two negative charges. Okay? So, uh, so okay, in general terms, uh, I think it's reasonable. The question is, why would God create, the God of quantum, create helium before he created hydrogen, if we're trying to figure out how hydrogen came into being, and from there eventually to stars, and then smash them into helium? Because you can understand how helium is formed in the stars, once you have hydrogen. But these people started helium and worked their way towards hydrogen. It's like, you know, God invented helium before he invented hydrogen. <laughs> so you figure that out. I mean, I think it was easier to form hydrogen than helium. All you need is one proton, one electron. You, th you would think that's easier, right? Why would God take the trouble of forming helium before he formed hydrogen is, is beyond my understanding. Okay, what is a lepton, just in case here? Uh, because we're talking about leptons, and this also is a can of worms. I'm not going to go in detail over it, but I just want you to understand what we're dealing with here. Lepton is an elementary particle, okay, of half integer spin, spin half, okay, that does not undergo strong interactions. I don't know what, uh, what they're talking about. What do you mean half spin? You know, when I spin the top, the whole top spins, and I guess if it spins halfway, you stop it or stop the movie or it falls or whatever, and you say, well, that was a half spin. Uh, I mean, how else are you going to understand it? Or maybe it's half a top spinning full spin. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to interpret the a half spin. And the answer is that they never define the word spin. They have no idea what it means in physical terms. Spin is not what spin means to a normal human being. When you spin a top, you say that's spinning. Everybody understands that. Everybody understands when you say the earth spins. Everybody understands that. Half spin, minus half, minus one spins. Nobody understands that at all. In fact, the people who propose it don't understand it. It's just a mathematical uh, device, invention, concoction. They say, uh, yeah, it's a half spin. So what do you mean by spin? They don't know. But whenever they want to explain like how a magnet attracts another, they insinuate that, you know, the electrons are spinning on both magnets, and that's why they attract the two magnets attract each other, because the electrons are spinning like a top in both magnets. So they use these words 
uh, they invent the word spin and they say, well, you know what I mean by spin, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean by spin. Well, okay, that's how a magnet attracts another. Uh, what, what do you really mean by spin? Oh, we don't know. Especially when they come with half spin and minus one spins and zero spins. You know, I mean, what is a zero spin? So, so again, you can't picture this. You cannot visualize what they're talking about. All you can do is use it, use the term that they invented, and they say, well, it's a mathematical contraption. And you got to go to university to understand what spin means. But when they want to give you the, the, the physical interpretation, they use spin as if it were the spinning of a top. So they, they have these dualities, which they get away with murder. Uh, because when people don't understand math, they don't care about math. They want to know, you know how a magnet attracts another. And the guy says, well, the electrons are spinning in the same way. And you're visualizing spin, what spin means to you, that the electrons are really spinning. You say, OK, I more or less understand that. But when you put them against the wall and you say, well, what do you really mean by spin? They don't know. They say, well, no, it's not the spin of a top. We, we have no idea. So <laughs> this, this is the issue. The issue is they have no explanations whatsoever, but they use these words. Okay? They use these words uh, like positive and negative. What do you mean by positive and negative? Oh, we don't know. These are all mathematical terms. It has nothing at all whatsoever to do with physical interpretations, which is what the normal average human being out there on the street wants to know, wants to understand. Okay? And there's two main classes of leptons uh, exist. Uh, charged leptons, also known as electron-like leptons, and neutral leptons, better known as neutrinos. Okay, So, uh, yeah, this is what the leptons are, and uh, you figure it out. These are just labels, names that they've invented. We have no idea what, what they're talking about. In fact, they, they can't draw a single electron. They say they filmed an electron. Swedes did a few years ago. They, they came on the news. You say, okay, what's, a, what's an electron look like? They say, well, we filmed it. And then they can't tell you what an atom looks like. I mean, if you, you filmed an electron and you filmed uh, or, or, or took a, an image of gluons holding quarks together, because they, what they have is they smash these uh, nucleons, one against the other, ions against ions. And they look at the explosion and say, that, that's a gluon, that's a quark. Okay? So, so here they have these traces of gluons and quarks. They have the, the width of the trace through the gas, meaning that they know how what the diameter of that gluon is or of that quark and that's inside a nucleon which is inside the nucleus of the atom and they, they can see these little particles or they image them and then you ask them well, what does an atom look like which is a monster compared to all these and they say oh we don't know they can't draw an atom because if they draw the planetary atom with a little ball you know made of three quarks uh, mediated by gluons and they have this electron going around you say well what keeps the electron bound to the nucleus, they can't answer that question. They can't tell you physically what keeps it bound to the, elect uh, to the nucleus. Why doesn't the electron fly away? Why doesn't it fall to the nucleus? So that's, these are the questions they can't answer. And those are the questions you should harp upon. You should ask those questions to all these uh, mechan uh, quantum mechanics who claim that they have a PhD and that they know a lot. OK, tell me why the electron doesn't fly away. Why doesn't it fall inside the nucleus? What physically prevents it from flying away? What physically prevents it from falling inside the nucleus? That's what they got to answer. And if they tell you field, you say field's not a physical object. Can't use a, the word field to explain that. Okay. Okay. What's the next era? Well, now we start with the matter area. Now we move for, fast forward thousands of years. Okay. So here it is. This is the uh, first stage of the matter uh, era, and it's the atomic. Um, what is it? Phase or uh, is it um, the epoch, the atomic epoch? Okay, and uh, the universe cools. Okay, so we're it's all about cooling, I guess, because it spreads out and it's so cold out there. It's like, I guess, moving inside a refrigerator. I don't know. Uh, the universe cools. Electrons attach to nuclei for the first time. Now we have the atoms. See, so far we had the helium atom, but it was without electrons. Now the electrons join the atom. Okay. And form atoms, uh, recombinations, okay? And uh, the second element finally is formed, uh, hydrogen, which is the first element on the you know, table of the elements, uh, helium, helium being number two, made of four hydrogen atoms, essentially. Okay, what comes next? Well, again, we jump uh, from thousands to millions of years now, okay? And we enter the galactic era, okay? Oh, wrong one, sorry. Let me put this one down here before I lose it. Give me a second here. Okay, here it is. Uh, this is the galactic era. Okay, and uh, so what do we have here? Well, the formation of galaxies. But the formation of galaxies is a little strange because <laughs> it's strange because we have no stars. Okay, all we have is 
whatever, it's called gas. So they say these islands of gas, those are galaxies because they are starless galaxies. If you can imagine such a thing. So it's just a, some kind of cloud of gas that's floating over here, another one over there, and another one over there. These are, I guess, the proto-galaxies. They're going to become galaxies eventually. Okay? This is where stars are going to form according to, to their evolution of the universe, the chronology. Okay? And, uh, yeah, it's also because of cooling. And uh, these are the seedlings of galaxies, these uh, clouds of gas. Okay? So that's how you have to interpret this. And then we enter the final stage which is the one I guess we live in today, okay? and that's the stellar era, or epoch. And what is this? Well, it's the formation of stars. And the formation of stars happens, you know, again, uh, you have these gases, and they form this, uh, what is known as the nebular hypothesis, where you have these spinning uh, masses of gas, and they collapse gravitationally, they start spinning and collapsing, until at some point it uh, nucleates, and uh, at some point, even further, it um, ignites because of the pressures of atom against atom. Okay? And at some point, that pressure creates heat, gravitational heat, gravitational pressure. And at some point, it ignites, and suddenly you have radiation come out of there, which is what we receive from the sun. Okay? So this is, this is the last phase. That's where we're at now. Uh, is there going to be another phase after this? Uh, maybe the... We, we covered what? We covered thousands of years, we covered millions of years, billions of years, I guess the trillions of years is the next stage, whatever that's going to be. Just uh, fizzling out into nothingness. The future of humanity, I guess, is gone. Because all matter will simply fly away so much from each other that it uh, turns into dust. That's, I guess, what you're supposed to imagine. That's the universe these people are proposing, that's the one they believe in. Okay? Okay. Um, so let's look at the comparisons of quantum mechanics versus uh, Christianity, religion, the Bible uh, story. Are they that different? Or are they different at all? And here you see it, okay? In one case, you have uh, God is assumed to be eternal. God creates heaven and the earth, okay? And we have all these different days. And they're all days, okay? You would think they're uh, typical 24-hour days. Uh, there's no reason to think otherwise that these represent millions of years or anything like that. And on the right-hand side, you see the differences. You see the Planck scale, uh, you know, that happened in so many zeros that we cannot even imagine that. Grand Unified happens at minus 40, uh, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Inflationary period, minus 36. Electro week, uh, minus 32. And quark and hand run uh, goes all the way to minus 12, minus 6. Okay, so um, uh, until you get to the lepton, you get to the first second. So that's how all this uh, proceeded. That's how fast all this was. And when you want to get into the nuclear era, well, then you get above a minute, a minute and a half, and so on. Matter era, well, that's totally different. 50,000 years, 200 million years, 300, 3 billion years. So it's a little different than what you see on the left. Okay, the, the, uh, what's different is the timing. One is uh, exponential, the other one is constant, or I would think it's constant, unless, you know, you want to interpret that, but I don't see why you would have to interpret the Bible. The Bible should be straightforward so that, no, so that everybody interprets the same thing. So you should not have to interpret the Bible. Okay. But here you see these people and they say, well, you know, uh, the first few seconds and microseconds, everything happened very fast. Boop, 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 boop. And suddenly you get to this stage where you produce the quarks and you produce the hadrons. And then it takes thousands of years until you get the first atoms. And from there, well, you get the galaxies first, which again seems like uh, counterintuitive. And then you get the stars. And in the case of atoms, again, you get the, hydro the helium atom before you get the hydrogen atom. That's, that's the chronology that these people have. And again, we have no idea where all this stuff came from. Uh, they say it's an unscientific question. Okay, so this is uh, after so many calculations, so much math, so all these PhDs from every university on the planet, uh, this is the, the scientific method that they follow has taken them to the, these conclusions, okay? So the question is whether what they're following is a scientific method. If this scientific method that they follow led them to such nonsense to, to come up with this evolution of how uh, forces converted into particles, particles, uh, loose particles into uh, formalized or, or organized particles such as atoms and eventually into stars and galaxies, or galaxies and stars, I guess the other way around, okay? So this is it, uh, this, it's, it's all magic, essentially. The method of mathematics, I call it, or the mathematical method. 
We have equations, observations, no definitions for any word, okay, important. They have experiment, they have predictions. What's the result of all this? Creation of something from nothing. That's the first one. And then we have this nonsensical, surrealistic, uh, unexplained process um, of formation of matter. That's what we have today. That's what we ended up with after thousands of years of doing math, experiments, predictions, etc., etc., etc. So the question is whether they're following uh, the right scientific method. Maybe they're following false gods. <laughs> okay. Maybe that's uh, what this is all about: following false gods. You know, you got to make sure you follow the right god if you want to have eternal life or whatever. Okay. Okay. What do we do in in real science? In science, we let's put it side by side so we can compare these. Okay. This is how we do it in science. We have to define our terminology so that we have one idea of what we're talking about. And the first thing we have to define is something, and then we have to define nothing. And something is the opposite of nothing. They are antonyms. And so they have to be defined in such a way as you keep them that way. That way you can use them consistently, and you can talk about whether something came from nothing and whether you can convert something into nothing. And so we say something is that which has shape and nothing that which doesn't have shape. See how easy it was all these years? And so uh, space is a synonym of nothing, and so is vacuum. And something is anything that has shape, okay? that which has shape. So we have something, that which has shape, nothing, that which doesn't have shape. Now we can use them consistently. And we cannot imagine a mechanism where you uh, convert something into nothing or vice versa, uh, taking nothing and converting it into something, with or without God, eternal or, or in any other way. You cannot create, you cannot imagine creating something from nothing, meaning that nothing suddenly acquired length, width, and height. And uh, from one frame of the movie to the next one, in other words, in zero time, suddenly something pops into being from nothing. That's known as magic. Not even God can do that kind of magic. Okay? And so anyone proposing creationism in any way, shape, or form, especially under the guise of science, needs to explain the mechanism. And afterwards, check himself into the nearest psychiatric ward. Okay, that's the conclusion we should reach. Okay, so let's compare what these people have versus what we propose. Okay, here's the quantum version, which is essentially the ether. If I can get this thing up there. Give me a second here. There he goes. That's quantum mechanics. That's the universe of quantum mechanics. Particles uh, flying around. Okay, and the question is, what's the black stuff? Okay, if you say space, well, you can't say space because the white stuff is space. Uh, space is made of particles in mathematical physics. So the particles that you see there moving around, that's space. you got to tell me what the black stuff is that gives shape to each one of these particles. The other one is why are they moving? I mean, you know, it should be a sandbox. And what you see here is a bunch of bees flying around, okay, moving. And for them, they would have to be alive, okay, flapping their wings or whatever. So there's a lot of questions in the uh, version of quantum mechanics. What do we propose instead? We propose that matter was not created. Uh, we're saying that matter was always there. It's eternal. Our universe, I hate to use the word universe, matter was eternal. And this is what it looks like. Here you get an idea. If we can get this thing here. Okay. It's a single thread universe. There's a single thread. Okay. It's a closed loop thread. And it's going to turn into the rope. Rope is going to go all around the universe. Going to nucleate into what we call atoms. And then all these atoms are going to be tied or bound to each other by the, what we call the electromagnetic rope. That's all we have in the universe. That's how simple our universe is. No creation necessary. It's just a single thread that uh, weaves all around the universe. Okay? And uh, it never happened. It never, as far as I'm concerned, I cannot imagine how the single thread morphed through a process into atoms and ropes. It's always been like that. There was no moment of creation. Matter is eternal because we cannot imagine atoms turning into space, into empty space, or empty space, that which doesn't have shape, suddenly acquiring shape and turning into the uh, thread, or atoms, or the ropes. So no, it's, it's always been like that. It's always going to be like that when we're gone. Okay? It's all, you're going to have all these islands, uh, galaxies, and they're going to have stars, and within those stars, you're going to have planets. Within those planets uh, or near there, you're going to have asteroids and gases and so on. All of this is going to be made of atoms. All these atoms are going to be connected by the ropes that interconnect every, any two atoms. And the whole entire unit, all that matter is connected to the matter in another galaxy as well, which is connected to the other one, to connect the one and to the other one. The entire matter in the universe is interconnected. Did it come into being 
did the rope somehow form atoms or, or did the thread form ropes? No, it's always been like that. <laughs> and that's what people have trouble, they have no trouble imagining God being eternal. They say, okay, God's eternal, he had no mother, no umbilical cord. Uh, but uh, when you say, well, the, the thread's eternal too, it's been there in the form that we see today. There's been no change, it's always been galaxies. And maybe the galaxies change a little bit here and there, and maybe they collide and form new galaxies or break apart. That, that yeah, that probably more than likely happened. But uh, other than that, all you have is just atoms forming parts of uh, matter, and that matter being stars and galaxies and planets and whatever. That's our universe. It's always been like that. It's always going to be like that. Okay? So in a nutshell, that is the universe we propose, and we propose it against what quantum mechanics proposes, which is all surrealistic, unimaginable. And if you come with general relativity, you know, with the black holes and dark matter and dark energy and Big Bang, well, that's a total mess. So you figure it out. And again, here we're not here to convince you because that's not our purpose. We're here to propose uh, two universes. Okay? It's up to you to choose which, whichever one appeals better to you. The important thing is to understand it, to understand what the differences are and what the criticisms are against mathematical physics.